and um, I will follow with this um, adjustments. I believe they can um, solve some, but not all, of the problems we've seen um, earlier this morning. I, I always um, apologize this little of physics, but I will try to be the simpler as I can. Physics. Well, we are dealing with a system with three um, specific um, characteristics. We have a reservoir, the bladder, with a given volume. In that reservoir, we have a pumping engine with some performance, with some power to evacuate, to empty that reservoir, the detrusor. And we have an outlet with a given resistance. In our case, the urethra. In our case, the female urethra. But this is a, st a system um, that it doesn't, man it doesn't matter if it, we are considering a man's bladder, a, wom a woman's bladder, or any other system with a, res a reservoir, pumping engine, and outlet resistance like a syringe, or a fireman's hose, or the, a cat, or a dog, or whatever. But in the lower urinary tract, we have some special features that make it different from a simple syringe or a simple um, um, inelastic outlet system. Our engine, the Truser, has variable power depending on several things. Depending on the length of the muscle or the trusor fibers, or if you want, depending on bladder volume. And that was explained by the Starling's law, as you know. That engine has variable power depending on the shortening velocity of its fibers. It's not just an engine like a syringe or um, any other pumping device, but this shortening velocity of fibers is paramount to the understanding of the emptying of a bladder, and that was explained elegantly by Eel. And moreover, it's an engine that is fueled by micturition reflexes. And to be short, reflexes between the central nervous system and the bladder, and reflexes between the urethra and um, the bladder. Other special features of our system, our lower urinary tract. We have not a rigid outlet. Most of times we have not a rigid outlet, but we can have it too in urethral stenosis. But in a normal man or in a normal woman, this outlet or the urethra is a distensible collapsible tube. And moreover, it's not only distensible collapsible, but, only, but also contractile. We have seen that there is contractile muscles within the urethra and outside the urethra. If it was a rigid tube, we could use this quasi-law uh, or equations uh, that I showed you before. But when it's collapsible and distensible, the equation is a little bit more complicated. We are not running into that, but because when we have an outlet that is distensible, the pressure on the reservoir influences also the radius or the section of the urethra. So pressure will rise the flow because of this equation, but also because it will increase the radius. So the outlet resistance equation varies with pathology. If we have a man or a woman 
with a urethra, a scarred urethra, a urethral stenosis, a completely rigid tube, we could well use those um, equations of Bernoulli or uh, Poiset, but we do not have that. And we range from um, urethral stenosis to um, elastic compression of proximal urethra in benign prostatic hyperplasia, ending in the normal, distensible, very, very low resistance female urethra. So we have this uh, range of different outlets, of different systems that are governed by different equations. But in each case, the flow will increase by these two factors, as we mentioned before. With bladder pressure in a linear way, but in a quadratic, or in the fourth power, with urethral section. So, if we, ha we have a uh, distensible urethra, radius can increase with bladder pressure as well. So, um, the equation will be more complicated. To say it in other words, flow is more influenced by radius, because it's the fourth potency or quadratic, than by pressure, especially in less distensible outlets, like in urethral stenosis. In elastic urethras, pressure acts in two ways, as I just told you, increasing flow by the means of the equation, but also by the influence of pressure on the urethral radius, if distensible enough. And as we are talking about women and normal women, it's distensible uh, enough to be shown. In summary, we have two variables um, in to, to achieve a measurement of this dynamics, two variables. The detrusor performance, or if you want to call it the detrusor fiber shortening velocity, or the detrusor strength, and urethral radius, and the urethral radius variability, in other words, elasticity of urethra. A little of maths. Um, when we shorten the detrusor fibers, when we contract the detrusor fibers, when we act our pumping engine, two things will result. We'll have a pressure inside the reservoir, what in our case we call it the detrusor pressure, and or flow. And or is underlined because we have it both or only one. If we have very, very low resistance, we can have only flow with no pressure, irrespective of the detrusioning, shortening force. And if we have a given uh, maximal resistance, we have a lot of pressure, but no flow. In other words, the trusor contraction results in bladder pressure, yes or no, depending not on the strength of the detrusor, but on the urethral resistance. That's the main thing. I, I, I will repeat this concept over and over during the, the day. When flow exists, then we have less pressure for the same amount of the detrusor contraction. It reminds me, when we, um, some years ago, we used to measure um, the, the reflux in children and relating it to the um, emptying phase or to the um, storing fa storage phase. Um, and for us, those days, it was more uh, severe when reflux resulted in during the storage phase than during the voiding phase, because during the voiding phase, we thought that we had more pressures in um, the bladder. It's the reverse. During voiding, for the same contraction, 
we have less pressure because we opened the urethra. So our system, our, our, the state of our system, it's an engineering statement. Our system state varies from the total urethral resistance, closed urethra, and maximal pressure, and very, very low outlet resistance with flow and less pressure, or zero pressure. I'd like to, comp uh, to compare the truser function with the biceps function, for instance. The truser contraction is then both a isometric with no shortening of fibers, rising pressure, like in our arm, the isometric phase of the biceps contraction results in muscle tone, not movement, and an isotonic phase with shortening of fibers producing movement of my forearm, in this case, or if you want, flow, in the case of the bladder. This isometric, isotonic balance depends on the resistance I can make in this forearm, or if you want, in the case of the bladder, on the resistance I can have in the outlet. So, isometric, it's equal to pressure. Isotonic, it's equal to flow. Let's see the case of avoiding contraction. You can recognize the curve of the, the truser pressure. You can recognize below the curve of a flow, of the resulting flow. We have here graphically the result of these two components of the truser contraction. The isometric resulting in the truser pressure and the isotonic resulting in flow. So flow in any voiding, in any micturition, is a function or is a mirror of isotonic phase of contraction and the truser pressure a mirror of the isometric um, phase of contraction. Let's see these two cases. You have the first case with no detrusive pressure, but with a high flow. And this other case with a high detrusive pressure and low flow. Probably the detrusive performance and the detrusive work is similar in both cases. What differs here is the outlet resistance. In a lower resistance state, the detrusive pressure, pressure will be low. There will be almost no isometric phase of contraction, almost isotonic with high flow. And with higher outlet resistance, it's the reverse. Most of the co contraction remains isometric, tonic, and we have low movement of the forearm. We have low flow. Then, bladder pressure, P that, is a function of the truser contraction and resulting flow. I will say that again and again. The truser pressure is a misleading term because we used to, even people that do daily urodynamics, used to understand the truser pressure, the truser pressure as a function of the, the truser contraction, and it's not. The truser pressure is a function of the truser contraction and the resulting flow. So it only reflects the truser performance if, by chance, we have a flow of zero. I mean, pure isometric contraction. If I start a voiding phase, but I cannot open the urethra, that the truser pressure, with no flow, indeed reflects the true the real detrusive performance in that particular patient. So, we know in these two cases, I, I'm sorry that the detrusive contraction in blue, um, it was some mishappening with the program because the detrusive contraction uh, should, be, should be put in, in red and the blue for the abdominal uh, pressure, but I'm sorry for that. 
the trues are a, a, a good detrusive pressure, a good flow, and here a less than good detrusive pressure, but a high flow. And we know th those contractions are good. All of them, all, both of them are good contractions because in the first ca case we have a high detrusive pressure. In the second case we have a good flow. In the first case we have a high isometric phase. In the second case we have a high isotonic phase. But how good are they? How can we transform this into numbers? How can, t can we um, um, put boundaries of normality uh, of these ranges of flows? Well, since contraction of the detrusor, or if you want, shortening of fibers gives rise to detrusor pressure and flow, what can we do to see what is the true, the true detrusive pressure? We must zero the flow to have a detrusive pressure as a true measure of contraction. How good is that contraction? I'm sorry for the blue as well. How good is that contraction? I don't know. But if I zero the flow, and I can do that by asking the patient to contract the urethra, or I can have a balloon catheter and suddenly occlude the urethra when I reach the maximum flow. And if I do that, of course that flow goes to zero and the trusor pressure rises. This is called the stop test. I force the flow to go to zero and the trusor pressure will rise. What I call it the PIDAT Q0. It's the detrusive pressure when I force the flow to zero. The stop test. This indeed is the true measure of detrusive contraction in that particular patient, should I say, in that particular phase of voiding or emptying. So, first message, PIDAT Q0, I'm sorry, it's not a validated notation. It's a term of mine. As member of the uh, standardizing committee, I shouldn't do that unless I explain you that that is not validated as a urodynamic notation. But the P that Q0, or the, the, the true pressure when I force the flow to zero, is the true measure of contraction. Should I repeat it? Be that when I force the flow to zero is the true measure of contraction. The bladder pressure varies widely with flow. So um, this detrusive contractility can only me be measured um, if we have a closed urethra. Um, this is, in other words, what I just told. To measure the bladder pressure at the maximum flow but with no flow. Paradox, the stop test. Urethra is closed suddenly when we think that the maximum flow is reached. We can do that by voluntary contraction of urethra. We can tell the patient when we see that probably we are reaching the maximum flow to suddenly contract the urethra. Or we can use a balloon occlusion of the bladder neck in that precise moment of maximum flow. But all of these, as you can imagine, is very unreliable because I never know if I'm really, really in the maximum flow. It's uncomfortable. You can imagine um, for some old women to have a voluntary contraction of their urethras, oh, unreliable, uncomfortable that can be. And so uh, this stop test depends on several and mainly uncontrollable local and personal variables. So we cannot rely on stop tests to um, appreciate the true measure of contraction. Um, graphically, we come again with a system of two, um, two, two, two axes. A y-axis, vertical, with the flow, 
And an horizontal axis of the detrusive pressure, as any uh, pressure flow nomogram you can know. Let's see what happens when we start the micturition. Of course, the detrusive pressure is rising. The flow is rising as well. Nothing out of normal. When we think we um, are in the maximum flow, uh, that point of the detrusive pressure, we interrupt the flow. So we have the stop, the flow will go to zero, as you can see here, will go to zero, and the pressure inside the bladder will rise. This rise in the trusa pressure after the stop test is the measure of the bladder contractility. So the point where the trusa pressure ends after the zero flow will be the bladder contractility. What is the projected isometric pressure? Since we cannot perform this um, test, stop test in every patient. It's not reliable, it's not, it's not comfortable, it's, 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 not, it's not practical. We can know what's the uh, behavior of uh, a given system. Let's see if, for instance, is a man. And that blue dot is the, the true the pressure at um, the true the pressure at maximum flow, the PDAT Q max. If I ask the patient to, to close it, his urethra, or if I occlude the urethra, where do I go in the true pressure in this stop test? To there, to there, or to there? Who knows? What is, for a given patient, the, the trusa pressure at zero flow? Well, the big thing is the theoretical extrapolation of these stop tests. And uh, this concept of the projected or presumed isometric pressure, if we can do that in a given population, we can do stop tests over and over in, uh, for instance, in a man or in a system. And after a while, we can see if those um, areas, those points of the trusa pressure are going to the first, to the second, or to the third area. And that's what Schaefer did. Um, he realized that using man, Young man, old man, man after TUR, uh, 500 and something man. Ruth helped him doing that. She's not there anymore. Um, and he realized that all of these projected pressures uh, ran in a parallel way. So he did a number of stop tests in man and in a fairly linear and parallel fashion, these, um, these lines ended up into a horizontal scale in the detrusor pressures that was related to the detrusor power and contraction. So he called this the PIP5. Why PIP5? It's the projected or presumed isometric pressure, but he realized that it's lines of the kind of X um, five uh, Y. That that means that that inclination of the um, of the lines in Q in mLs per second is five times in centimeters of water be that. So it, they call this the PIP five, the projected or presumed isometric pressure, uh, or PIP five, and recently named for men as the bladder, bladder contractility index. That's how the bladder contractility index that you know was constructed. 
But that was in man. Different kinds of men, different kinds of pithat cumax, different, different kinds of um, obstruction and the truser powers. But they realized that they could elaborate such a scale. And in this scale um, of uh, probably the truser pressure of zero flow could be drawn with more power of contraction to the left, less power of contraction to the right. So we could have two different men, two different cases. The case one with completely different flows and the detrusive pressures at maximum flow and the case two with less flow and more detrusive pressure. This case two is far more obstructed probably than the case one but they belong to the same class of contractility because when we zero their flow in a stop test, they both end in the end of this third line. So they belong to the same class of contractility of the truser. This way, a the truser contraction nomogram could be constructed for that particular population of 500 men, young, old, and after operation. So, in such a nomogram, we can have several areas drawn by these lines. In gray, of course, a high flow, very low pressure, but uh, with a good contraction. In yellow, a low flow with higher pressure, but with worse contraction. Can you believe this? More detrusive pressure, but worse contraction. And in red or orange, low flow, higher pressure, but with a very good contraction, but of course obstructed. So we can superimpose in a obstruction nomogram you know already, this contractility nomogram, Schaeffer considered seven degrees of contractility. The weaker, he called the very weak, weak minus, weak plus, normal minus, normal plus, and strong after plotting and producing uh, stop tests in 500 and something men from non-obstructed to clearly obstructed men. So, after this work, we no longer have to produce, in that particular population, we no longer have to produce stop tests because we now know where the stop test ends in any particular case. So we have this presumable, probable, projected isovolumetric pressure that allows us to produce this nomogram. But what about women? We have some problems different different problems in women. Some women have abdominal contractions, so we cannot, um, we, we cannot know if the flow is uh, produced by abdominal contraction or detrusive contraction or both. Stop tests are even less reliable because uh, women have less ability to close their urethra suddenly at the maximum flow. And since urethra is often a very, very distensible tube with more radius variability, um, it's very difficult to apply those principles in these women. But if we, we do not have abdominal contractions, if we can do stop tests reliably, and in some patients we can, and if the urethra is not hyperdistensible, for instance, in older women, the same principles should apply. We performed a series of stop tests in women, and as you can see, when we suddenly occlude the urethra, some of them uh, behave like men with PIP5. I mean, the detrusive pressure will be uh, five times in. Uh, centimeters of water, the flow in uh, the first flow or the, the, the maximum flow in, in, in males per second, PIP5. But some other women, particularly with higher flows, behave like PIP1. When the stop test will end 
only in the trusser pressures with equal amount of the maximum flow in centimeters of water. It goes, for instance, in, if the maximum flow is 20, we produce a stop test and the pressure will rise only to 20 centimeters of water. So it's PIP1. Some other women will have PIP more than five. That means that when we produce a stop test, the detrusive pressure is more than five times the initial flow. And some other women um, is PIP uh, less than five. So, can we draw any pattern out of this mass, out of this anarchy? So, the result, the graphical result of stop tests in women is this one. PIP 5, PIP 1, PIP more than 1, PIP less than 5. Everything can be um, shown in women and that's why it's very difficult to be straightforward and construct a similar nomogram of contraction like Schaefer did for men. But, in what women we, we see PIP, PIP different from 5? In older women, more than 65, in women with very, very high flows, very, very high flows, when, li like Paulo said, those women that we have no doubt that they are not obstructed, people with 40 mils per second of flow, they will have stop tests and, of PIP1, but I don't need a nomogram to diagnose obstruction in women with 40 mils per second because I know they are not obstructed. In people, women, with higher flows and less obstruction, they have PIP closer to one. Um, and in the other women, uh, more obstructed or in, with doubts of obstruction, they behave pretty much like men with PIP 5. So in women with lower flows and higher pressures, those women that we have to diagnose, they behave like men. Oh, there's a paper of um, Griffiths and Resnick, 2004. Um, they realized that most of women with more than 65 years of age, they behave in, they behave in uh, stop tests as PIP1, so PIP5 is not suitable. <coughs> to um, use in this group. So Schaefer nomogram, in other words, Schaefer nomogram for males is not suitable for use in women with very, very high flows and more than 65 years of age. Probably the, the problem is that women are more prone to be, to, to, to um, to obey to the ill equation. And those pips are not uh, linear, but are parabolic lines. Uh, maybe in the future, we can have a curved uh, way of diagnosing these detrusive the contraction uh, deficits in women. Um, at least mathematically, it should be like that, but it's too early to say. I tried with a um, series of mine um, using this uh, nomogram in 2000, 274, I think, women. And uh, those blue lines are PIP5, the uh, brown lines are PIP1. Of course it matters, it matters a lot if you use a PIP1 type of uh, contractility nomogram or a PIP5 a type of contractility nomogram, it matters a lot in the extremes. In one case, you could di over-diagnose um, the truser contractility in the extremes of flows like 40 or 50, and you can, could under-diagnose obstruction in these extremes of pressures of 100 or more. These extremes are not only rare, it's quite rare to have uh, 100 and something pressure, the true pressure in a woman, and it's quite rare, but not so, having 
40 or more um, mils per second of voiding. But these extremes, like Paulo said, need no nomogram. I don't need any nomogram to say that this woman in lower, the lower with 100 and something, um, be that with almost no flow and 110 uh, centimeters of water. I don't need any nomogram to say that she's obstructed. And I don't need any nomogram to say that those with 40 something uh, mils per second of flow are not obstructed and have a good detrusive contraction. I don't need any nomogram. I need the diagnostic tool for the intermediate. For those that I clinically or by other means cannot say if they are or they are not in obstructive or in risk of a obstruction uropathy. What about the abdominal contraction? Well, um, of course it's a problem. Um, one third of women in our series, in all series, one third, 30 percent of women have some abdominal contamination in it, or, or voidings. And if there is an abdominal contamination, that means that the flow is generated not only by the detrusor influence, but also by the abdominal influence. So we cannot use a uh, nomogram using the true pressure and flow. We should include some um, abdominal thing on it. And uh, some people like Schaefer, for instance, and Ruth are trying to draw a nomogram using PVAS instead of PDAT. That could do the thing. So, um, how can we adjust the, uh, the, the nomogram, the male nomogram of Schaefer to females? Well, uh, with some limitations, I think we can. And um, I do this in practice. And uh, to be certain, um, I think most urodynamicists do uh, use this um, double nomogram of Schaefer's with some adjustments to females. What should I say? I would keep the PIP5 option, or I, I mean Schaefer's. It's easy of use. It's in every uh, computer in uh, Eurodynamics. It's there. It's already done. But I would not consider the exceptionally low pressure high flows, but I do not have to consider that because these women do not need any diagnostic tool. Eventually, after that paper of uh, Griffiths and Resnick, I would exclude women older than 65, maybe. And definitely, uh, for the time being, I have to exclude one third of women because they have abdominal contamination of their voidings. But with that, those limitations, I can profit from the simplicity ease of use, and a uh, clinical value long used by urologists in men avoiding dysfunction. And what about the measure of urethral resistance? That was contraction. And what about urethral resistance in women? That's a little bit more simple. We reviewed uh, the resistance or the obstruction nomograms, the old ones, the Massey, Lamax, Zimmer, Chassin, Blavis, Grouts, we reviewed them already. We superimposed on the Schaefer's nomogram and we realized that these old uh, squared uh, nomograms are pretty much the same or the, they superimpose into the um, areas of one, two, three, four, or more of Schaefer, leaving as unobstructed only the area of zero, that triangle of zero in blue. There is an obstruction coefficient for women that was calculated as 0 0.35. That means that this line is a line y equal to 0 0.35x. And it's approximately the same line that Schaefer draw for the division between zero and one uh, degree of obstruction. So what I would say is this is a boundary of 
uh, normality for women should be that zero or that uh, obstruction coefficient of 0.35. Uh, as uh, we saw earlier, men are considered to be obstructed only with three or more, um, three or more grades of Schaefer. I consider a obstructed women with those limitations before, I consider a obstructed women with more than uh, one grade of Schaefer or more than these obstruction coefficient of 0.35. Here again, we can use this, the ease of use of this um, all around uh, nomogram in all uh, urodynamic apparatus. So putting all together, the truth of performance and the urethral resistance have to be measured both to assess this increasingly frequent female voiding dysfunction. Most of them is iatrogenic. Women have more, are more wide range in these variables, urethral resistance and the truth of performance. Older women and those with very high flows have different behavior, so we cannot rely on those isovolumetric or isometric uh, pressure um, projections than the rest of women and men. By the way, these women that are probably obstructed, and particularly the women after an operation, they truly behave like the PIP5. They truly behave like men with the prostate. So in those particularly women suspected of, suspected of having obstruction, we could rely on uh, Schaefer's nomogram. So validated female obstruction nomograms, those old nomograms of Massey Abrams, Lasagne, and, of Chassagne and, and Gary Lemack, are not so different from these in man. The Truser uh, pressure flow plots are not valid under, under abdominal contaminant. That's a problem still to be solved. One third of women, even if we ask them not to use abdomen during her voidings, and probably have that, you have that experience, they, they swear that they didn't use any abdominal contraction to empty their bladders, but we saw they used so they do not realize, one third of women do not realize they use usually abdominal contractions. So the boundaries of normality are less well defined than in men. We have to bear this in mind. And I, I, I believe that, like Schaefer used to say, that we should have continuous numeric scales instead of using uh, normal, abnormal, weak, uh, normal, minus, strong, uh, very weak terms like he did in man. Questions to be answered. The use of progressively thinner catheters improved our intubated flow plots and we do not have to use not anymore that thing of Blavis um, uh, free flows. Um, vesicle pressure, like Ruth just said, um, instead of the truza pressure plots can prevent this misleading effect of abdominal strain. It's a question to be asked. Mathematical simplification of these nomograms um, have to be done to speed up their urgent clinical use because we clinically urgently need a measure of not only the Truza contraction performance, but also of the Truza of, of um, outlet uh, obstruction. Um, thank you. And let me um, introduce the ICS wiki. It's uh, very easily found in the ICS site. And it's under construction, but it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. And you can find here most of um, accepted definitions and their explanations um, in a very, very easy way. And it's completely open and free to search. Um, I propose the Marcus Drake to, to, since it's a Wikipedia of incontinence, maybe we could call it WikiLeaks, but he, he didn't agree. <laughs> Uh, 
I believe uh, we have some only a few minutes if you allow me to When I do a Eurodynamic report, women, women with, her, with a suspected voiding dysfunction, and uh, it, it, she strains during the voiding, what do you, and it's more difficult to glorify if it's obstructed. If she right? strains, I, I cannot compromise myself on, um, on, on diagnosing obstruction or underactivity. Do you? I just um, described that there is an abdominal um, straining for a uh with or without a detrusor component, but I cannot I cannot say if the detrusor is is good enough or not good enough because I, I can not draw any conclusions with that abdominal contamination. Of course, Peter Rozier, for in, for instance. He claims that if a woman uh, has um, abdominal straining, most probably she's not obstructed. Uh, I believe he's right, but we cannot say anything about the uh, detrusor uh, power. You could argue that if she strains, that is because she has no detrusor power to empty uh, the bladder, but I don't believe that's true. Because even women with the chooser power enough to empty their bladders, they strain and strain again. Um, so, urodynamically, that's a dire strait. Chris. You're not supposed to do <laughs> to make <laughs> put questions. So, I just want to, to ask for the audience because it's a practical and a conceptual uh, question. Uh, how many times do you repeat the, the exam in the same session for the same patient? Because that's something that I'm uh, very interested in looking for uh, from the audience, that people that deals with urodynamics, and also uh, because we can see a clear uh, modification, clear change in the way the patient void if you do two, three, or four times. They stop straining, the pressure flow diminishes, get smoother, and so like, like measuring your blood pressure and, and considering only the second measurement. Yes, like that, something like that. But yeah. if, you put in, if you're working on nomograms, it has a tremendous impact in considering obstruction or not. So yeah. uh, I, I don't do less than four times in my patients. Less than four? Not, not at least four times. I, I would agree with you, but I confess I, I cannot do that for logistic reasons. Uh, but in a way, I believe that uh, at least two measurement, different measurements have to be done. And we are always very keen on having a free flow before, of course. I see. Okay. Ruth. Yeah, but can I ask your audience uh, how many times Ruth? the people uh, used to do? I, I'm, I'm doing the same of one to two and, 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 uh, and free flow. How, how, which, which speed do you fill? Uh, 50 ml per minute. You, you do less than that. Do you, do you perform uh, how many fillings in, in, in average? Two fillings? Good. Let me, in, in, in a couple of minutes, um, um, propose you some important, or to, to my opinion, important articles um, published recently in the last two or three years on this subject. I divided this in clinical, postoperative wedding dysfunction, urodynamics, other parameter, parameters for obstruction, therapies for obstruction, and last but not least, about underactivity. I, I, I couldn't, um, for some reason I forgot to, to take um, that uh, graphics of um, um, papers published by year that you can see in PubMed, for instance, and if you search by underactivity, 
um, in 2014 and 2013, there were more published, uh, published articles on underactivity than in the rest of the human history. Clinical, um, well, th that is um, just the, 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 the stone of, of, of these uh, female voiding dysfunction is from uh, Blyvus Grouts. Um, you know this, the, the causes. Um, Ang Shorn Kuo. Um, clinical symptoms are not reliable in the diagnosis of lower urinary tract dysfunction in women. That's an important thing to be read and to understand from Ang Shorn Kuo. Um, this is an important one from Dudley Robinson and David Staskin and Heinz, Heinz Kölbel of uh, Neurology Urodynamics in 2012. Um, and stresses the lack of consensus, but the, the need for a consensus on diagnosing um, not only the syndromes, but uh, also the voiding dysfunction in women urodynamically. In November 2011, um, there is this article in BJUI um, uh, with outlet obstruction after sling surgery um, so it's um, it's a good revision of on the subject some 11 years or so after uh, worldwide experience on tapes uh, subarethral tapes. This is from 2014. 14, uh, did the reader? Um, it's a review, and they found five to 20 percent of post-operative obstruction. It's not a rare. Uh, uh, thing, and they define as obstruction as Chassaigne or Gary Lamac did more than 25 um, centimeters of water in Qmax under 12 mils per second. Urinary retention um, in 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 women in current opinion 2014. Let's move on. Um, therapies for obstruction. This is. Um, well, this underlines the importance of um, diagnosing uh, some kinds of functional obstruction in women because we are more and more, as most of urologists already do, uh, treating some uh, functional proximal cervical obstructions in women with alpha blockers as we do for ages in men. Urodynamics. Um, um, the importance of preoperative urodynamic to ascertain the obstruction. Uh, they used the Blyvus nomogram in uh, 2013. Pressure flow nomogram for women with uh, lower inert. This is a group from Poland, I think, August 2014. And they propose a uh, separating line, a cutoff line of obstruction of 1.5 of Qmax per plus 10 is approximately the obstruction coefficient index of 0 0.35 I showed you um, earlier. This is uh, just August 2014. Uh, August 2014, I would urge you, urge is not a good, uh, <laughs> it's not a good word to use, but uh, I would propose you to um, read the August Urological Clinics of North America is devoted to urodynamics and there are two or three important um, chapters on pressure flow studies in women so it's not uh, rocket science it's to be art to be used pressure flow studies in women as well um, this last this last word um, Further investigation is needed to establish acceptable urodynamic criteria for defining the truser underactivity in women. That's our problem. 2013 August, uh, this group proposed this nomogram. It's uh, more or less more ml of Qmax, less uh, centimeters of water of PDAT, the older. Um, uh, nomograms of um, Gary Lamac and uh, Philip Zimmern, but they still use it and propose it in 2013. 
2013 August. Uh, most of publications about on this subject are in August. That, that must be studied. Um, this is from Victor Nitti, um, and uh, he, they pro they propose that uh, preoperative uh, urodynamics are not important uh, when we have to cut a a, a tape in, in a post-operative obstruction, but if storage symptoms, it's not important because it's it's an obvious diagnos diagnosis. But if there are storage symptoms after the operation and the uh, indication for intervention, they feel that if they are more obstructed than with um, the trusor overactivity, the results of unobstructing surgically are more uh, important. So it's valuable for patient counseling. 2013, um, the anatomical and functional blood outlet obstruction are quite different. Uh, they found they, uh, the Qmax is lower in anatomical than in functional blood outlet obstruction, I believe so. Um, October 2012, it's uh, Gérard Amaronco, um, it's in French, there's one progrès en urologie, um, and they stressed the importance of, um, of, of um, the trusor, uh, the pressure flow and urodynamic investigations. Uh, again, Victor Nitti, of course, October 2012. Um, it's, um, uh, Victor Nitti, his point is that video urodynamics, it's important to uh, join with manometric measurements because most of these obstructions can be diagnosed not by manometric or pressure flow curves, but, but by the image of the urethra. And video urodynamics can give us both. Um, again, Victor Nitti, it's, it's, it's absolutely similar. Ruth, you're there. Um, pressure flow uh, for studies uh, is the, or are the golden standard for the analysis of Avoiding in females and uh, avoiding in females and children, the limits are less precise, but the same principles apply. Thank you, Ruth. That's my point. Um, this is is coming from um, I, I believe Japan. Um, the procedures. The, this is not the post-operative obstruction. It's the reverse. Uh, some people with um, procedures curing the prolapse improve the trusor contractility and urethral obstruction. No, um, no surprise. 2014 again in oh, again in August because it's the urological clinics in North America of late August um, about urodynamics in the evaluate, evaluation of female LUTs when they are helpful and uh, how to use them. So um, there are important role, not for urinary incontinence or pure stress urinary incontinence, we know that, but it's tremendously important when we suspect of uh, avoiding dysfunction. This is from my friend Rizwan Hamid. He proposed another female uh, nomogram with that uh, um, oblique line of P that max of the double of Q max, and he, they claim that separates the radiographically obstructed uh, women with a high sensitivity and specificity. So this is another version of the obstruction coefficient index. As I told you, this is is going some millimeters to the right, some millimeters to the left, depending on the population we are studying. This is um, from, from uh, Francoise Valentini and Philippe Zimmern, um, a group, a French group. They are proposing um, new nomogram, but there again, this is the Blyvis Grouch nomogram, and there is nothing uh, really, really um, new to be said. Um, this is an abstract of, of Werner uh, Schaeffer and, and Stasa Tadik in their Griffiths 
Resnick, the group of uh, Pittsburgh, they are there where they are proposing the uh, obstruction coefficient index of 0 0.35. I show my series of patients of 256 patients, and uh, with the obstruction coefficient of one, that's for males, you can see it's no use of separating uh, people from, from obstructed to non-obstructed, but that one of 0 0.35, I think, could be of use, and it's absolutely superimposed to the zero area of the Schaefer's nomogram. This population, of course, was straining excluded. Only women with no abdominal contamination I used there. This is, oh, this is from Paolo. He, you heard about this before, okay? Uh, September 2014, um, other parameters of obstruction. Then again, I think it's b becoming fashionable after my friend uh, Miguel Ramos and others um, using other parameters for obstruction and you have the nerve growth factors or the ratio nerve growth factors creatinine um, significantly higher in female obstruction. So. There are probably some other means for us to confirm or even diagnose non-invasively obstruction in women other than your dynamics. Let's see. The same with this, bladder trabeculations in, in, in women. Um, bladder trabeculations are more easily found in women with uh, obstruction, like in, in men. And this, and um, only a few seconds to this um, last topic, the underactive bladder is the term, the fashionable term, is what we are trying to define in, in this organization. Uh, overactive bladder um, had, had a, a lot of um, different um, papers published in 2014. And I propose this, I think it's most important, of Osnan and Chapel and uh, all those names, you know, Heinz Kabul, Dr. Niti, Fonswab, Roger Makovsky, uh, Paul Abrams, you name it, uh, and Helen Ween. Um, the truser under activity is surrounded by ambiguity and confusion, lack of accepted terminology, definition, diagnostic methods, and, and criteria. So we have a lot of work to do. Under active bladder, September 2014, um, the progression, Michael Chancellor, the progression uh, to, from uh, uh, overactive bladder to underactive bladder, and they stress the uh, concept of having both overactive and underactive, and they are not the opposite. Ruth again, <laughs> the truser and activity. Um, well, pressure flow curves with methodological limitations. This article is uh, what we were talking about today and is stressing the importance of the afferent ways of uh, bladder sensitivity or sensation to explain most of underact activity and uh, under active bladders at some uh, usually uh, some propose the under activated bladder perhaps some bladders are not under active but under activated by central nervous system or so um, it's it's very well um, it's very well addressed in in this one in 2014 as well the many faces of impaired bladder empty from Carl Eric Anderson as well, uh, July, um, July 2014, and the lack of therapeutic targets to treat underactive bladder. The other bladder syndrome from uh, Michael Chancellor, uh, 2013, your dynamic examination is necessary for the diagnosis of underactive bladder or underactive detrusor. This is from pediatric urology. I found this important because uh, in children, they have another syndrome, this what they call the detrusor under utilization disorder. It's the stubborn kid that does not want to void and to go to the toilet. And after some time, they do have 
under active or underutilized bladders, this willful and frequent voiders. That's something for pediatrics to know. And I think it's the last one. I, 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 I propose you this uh, very important um, article in Neurologic Dynamics, um, stressing the afferent function as a, a main cause of um, underactive bladder. So underactive detrusor is a failure of activity or activation. That's why the underactivated bladder. And again, Philip Smith, uh, diminished central sensitivity uh, to volume afferent activity contributes to detrusor underactivity in non-obstructive, non-neurogenic symptomatic patients. And this is coming from, it's not yet published, but it, it will see the light uh, this, this year. So wrapping up, the differential diagnosis of lower urinary tract uh, dysfunction in women cannot be based on LUTs alone. Voiding dysfunction need to be measured and its component, obstruction and the truce of performance, balanced. Post-operative obstruction is a growing problem. Problema. That's for you, Ruth. Uh, problema. Um, female, different from male, function different from anatomical. Pressure flow curves, the golden standard for the analysis of voiding. Other parameters of obstruction can be important, like NGFs, like the truser um, uh, thickness. Cutoffs for obstruction and contractility vary with the population, and underactive bladder still needs an accepted definition. That's all. Thank you.